Amanda welcome back to my channel and before we get into today's video I just wanted to quickly thank this month's patrons and especially big thank you this month to Janine Vienna Rachel and Lisa you guys are amazing and I also wanted to announce that my story Celestial is now officially available for pre-order so if you would like to have a hard copy of this Book, then you can check out the first link in the description bar it will send you to my store envy shop where you can order this book and the people who order it on pre-order will get an extra special bonus vinyl decal with your book and pre-orders will be open from October 18th at 10 p.m. Pacific time until October 31st at 11.59 p.m. Pacific time. It will still be available after that point, but the vinyl decals are limited edition, so they will only be available if you order within that time frame. Now, getting into the point of today's video, I wanna walk you guys through the entire process of making this story. You can call it a comic, you can call it a graphic novel, you can call it a zine, whatever you decide to call it, I am going to walk you through the more or less 10 basic steps that I did to take this from an idea to a physical book that I now have in my hands. So if that sounds like something you'll be interested in, then let's get started. Now, as mentioned, there are going to be 10 steps to this process that I will be breaking down. However, don't take this as an exhaustive tutorial. This is not going to look at every single option. Basically, I'm going to briefly highlight all the directions that you could take from beginning to end, but with a primary focus on the fork in the road that I decided to take. So bear in mind that there are probably still some areas where you're going to need to do some additional research. Step one brainstorming. Now, this kind of goes without saying, but you kind of need to have an idea before you can write or illustrate or publish a book. So many of you probably have an idea out there. Maybe you have your own original characters, or maybe you kind of vaguely have a story in mind, but you're not really sure where you want to take it. Well, this is going to kind of be the precursor step that you need to finish before you can move on to the next step. So if you have some characters or a plot in mind, that's great. Just make sure that you've developed it to the point where you feel like the characters are fully fleshed out and fully developed. You have a good sense of who they are and what they would do in certain situations. Make sure you have a general idea of the plot and make sure that your quote unquote story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. I think this step is arguably one of the lengthiest steps in this entire process and many projects live and die at this phase. But if you are passionate about this idea and you do feel like you have a story that has a beginning and a middle and an end and that people would want to read it, then you can move on to step two. Step two is planning. This is not a very exciting step, but it's very, very critical before you move on to anything else. The first thing that you should ask yourself in the planning phase is, do you have a deadline? Do you have a goal that you're trying to meet to finish this project? Are you giving yourself a year? Are you giving yourself six months? Are you giving yourself 10 days? This deadline is obviously going to look different depending on the size and level of detail involved in your idea. For my project, Celestial, I knew I wanted it to be a 31 page story because I wanted to do it as part of Inktober, which meant it had to launch sometime within the month of October. Personally, I gave myself about a month and a half to do this project from beginning to end. If I can give you a piece of advice, I would say take your deadline, look at how long that's going to take you, and double it. I think I probably would have benefited a lot from having closer to three months to finish this project instead of the month and a half that I was scrambling towards the finish line every step of the way. Next, you want to ask yourself what format this book is going to be in. Is it going to be printed? Is it going to be a digital file? Or is it going to be both? How are you going to get your story out there? Where are you going to share it? And research those options. For me personally, I knew I wanted to have a printed book, but I also wanted the book to be available online. Next, ask yourself what tools are you going to need to illustrate the book? Are you going to go a traditional medium route or a digital route or a combination of the two? 
Primarily, I did this comic traditionally, but I definitely could not have done without the digital components that I will get into later for certain parts of the project, mostly the finishing touches. Now, if you do plan to print your project, how are you going to print it? This is something that you want to be thinking about now because if you're making these decisions towards the end of your project, you're more likely to be hasty and not think things through. So ask yourself, do you have the ability to print the project yourself? Even if you do have an at-home printer, would you rather outsource the project to somebody who can get it done more professionally? These are things to consider and I'm going to talk a little bit more about printing later on in the video. Next, what size are your pages going to be? This matters both for if you only offer a digital copy of the book or have it printed as a physical copy as well. If you upload it digitally online, each website is going to have slightly different parameters for the size your page needs to be. If you plan to print it, you do want a really high quality file and there are several different book standard sizes that you could use. Personally for me, I printed the book on legal size paper, which when you fold it in half is eight and a half by seven inches. So my book is roughly eight and a half by seven inches. It's a little smaller once you kind of trim off the excess paper, but it's roughly about that size, which I feel like is great for holding in your hand. It feels really nice and it's not too hard to see the little details and read the text. So for me, it was a good size, plus it's a standard paper size, so it's easy to find, but you might wanna do some research about the size of book that is right for your project. Once you know the size of your page, you probably wanna make a template. I had both a physical template that I had drawn out on a piece of paper and a digital template. So if I was thumbnailing digitally, I was thumbnailing on the same template as I would be thumbnailing traditionally. And I'll get into thumbnailing and all of that a little bit later, but you kind of want to have a universal template that you can use wherever you are when you're planning your book. Next, something that you want to think about but not fully, fully commit to just yet is roughly how many pages your book will have. Sometimes this matters if you are outsourcing to a printer, but it's also just important for you to think about in terms of writing the book, which is going to be our next step. There's a big difference between writing a 10 page story and a 50 page story. If you feel like your project falls more in line with something like a 10 to 20 page story, then you can leave yourself a little bit of a margin of error somewhere around that number. But Sometimes you might find that your 10 page story is actually a 50 page story and you might have to rethink your entire project altogether. So it's just important to kind of think about what you're aiming for. Do you want it to be like a sturdy book? Is it going to be a book with multiple volumes or is it just going to be a kind of quick read short story? Mine is definitely more in that quick read short story zine department. So it's 36 pages total and the actual story itself is 31 pages. And lastly, you want to be looking ahead as much as you can to think about what, if anything else, do you need to complete this project? You might need to invest in additional supplies, maybe outsource to some of your friends to see if they have things that you can use to help you save a little bit of money. If this is your first time doing a project like this, I can almost guarantee that there are things that you need that you haven't thought of yet. It's going to happen. And yes, it's not the end of the world if you have to pick them up later down the line, but you probably want to be planning for those investments in the early phases of your project. Now moving on to step three, which is writing. Odds are good that you already have a version of your story written out. If this is a story you've been thinking of for a while, then you probably have written something to the effect of a basic outline or even a full-on novel that you're now wanting to change over to a comic or an illustrated story. Ask yourself this question. Is my story in its current state optimized for the kind of project I am trying to create? For example, let's say you wrote a novel, but you want to create a comic. You're going to have to rewrite your novel for a comic. You're going to have to write it in terms of panels and pages and dialogue that matches with the pacing of something like a comic book. Otherwise, you're going to end up with something that doesn't really translate very well and might not come across that great once you're in the later steps of this process. For me personally, I kind of wrote my story like a script with a few sentences on each page. 
Then I broke that down even more by deciding which text was going to go in which panel. You really want to be careful if you're doing something like a comic book to not overcrowd your panels with too much text. It's going to look busy and it's ultimately going to take away from the visual aspect of the comic, which is kind of the point. <laughs> Also something that's really important about this step is that a lot of it could be subject to change. You might find that once you start thumbnailing the project, the words don't really flow like you thought they would. So you have to make some last minute changes to figure out how to make the story come alive on the page. And that leads me to step four, which is thumbnailing slash storyboarding. Now, you can think of these kind of like interchangeable steps, thumbnailing and storyboarding, but I kind of like to tease them apart a little bit, even though they are related. So you can think of thumbnailing as just getting the general idea down for what you want that panel to look like. Maybe you don't know exactly what the shape of that panel is going to be, but you do know you want these characters in that panel and you want them interacting in this way. Now, storyboarding is taking your thumbnails and arranging them in a way that flows and makes sense. The reason I am telling you this is because it's not what I did. <laughs> I sort of did my thumbnails and storyboarding simultaneously, and I found that at parts, it felt really stiff and if I didn't end up liking it, I was already kind of committed to it. So I would say do all your thumbnails for the entire story and then kind of make a puzzle out of it where you then take those thumbnails and arrange them into a storyboard, which will then become your page to page layout for the next part, which we'll get into in just a minute. The other important part about the thumbnailing and storyboarding process is if you need to make changes, make them here. You don't want to be making them later on in the project when things are finalized because you're going to have to do a lot more correcting than you would probably like. So it's okay if you have to make changes to your writing or to your panel design or even to the number of pages that you have in the project at this phase because that's what this phase is about. It's really just kind of fleshing this project out to see what it actually might look like when it's done. For my thumbnails personally, I did a combination of digital thumbnails and traditional thumbnails which was kind of odd. These were my traditional thumbnails and at the beginning of the project they were very polished and clean and they had the text that was going to be on that page. As we continue on into later in the book, they became really quick and messy and that was actually after I did more of the quick action poses digitally because I had less reservations about messing up digitally and I could kind of move things around and procreate. These were kind of my guides going into the next step. Step five is sketching. This is kind of like your final draft of the storyboarding page that you developed in the previous step. Once you have a thumbnail that you like and you rearrange that thumbnail into your storyboard and you have all the panels on that page, then you can basically redraw those panels onto your template that you created, whether that's digitally or traditionally. You're going to basically sketch out the lines for that page just like you would any illustration, basically. This is a very time consuming process. And again, you wanna leave some room for flexibility here because odds are good that once you scan and upload this page digitally and then import it into your formatting software, which we'll get to, you might have to end up cropping things or moving them around. So a good rule of thumb here is to keep important parts of your image away from the edges because they're more likely to get cropped off and think about where you want the reader's eyes to go on this page. Make sure that you're not sending the reader all the way from one corner of the page to the next and back again. Try and have like a flow between the pages so that their eye just kind of naturally leads them down the page. Make sure any important objects that are in this image are going to be seen and aren't likely to be covered up by text bubbles later on in the process. Another thing about text bubbles that I'll just mention, I did not do my text traditionally at all. That was all digitally. So if you do the same, I would definitely just say plan where you think you might want those text bubbles to go. Leave space for them because if you just fill the entire panel with your characters and important information, 
some some of it's gonna have to get covered up so just think about that just kind of have it in the back of your mind now step six moving on to inking now if you're doing this digitally then there really isn't anything different that you're doing um, other than you're just coloring digitally instead of traditionally but just kind of a general piece of advice whether you're doing your comic digitally or traditionally is to kind of limit your colors when you scale the illustrations down into panels that are side by side on a page it has a tendency to look a little bit busy you can eliminate some of this by limiting the colors in your color palette avoiding adding too many details and just kind of making sure that the reader doesn't have to work too hard to figure out what's going on in that image and in this phase my general piece of advice is just to work smarter not harder when I was inking the Celestial pages, I definitely created a process that allowed me to be pretty messy. For example, I would do the backgrounds in all blue ink because I knew I could be really messy with the blue ink, especially when I had my character Rhea in that panel because she has just this massive black hair that if I got a little bit of blue ink, that's fine. It was going to get covered up by black hair, so it didn't really make that big of a difference you're going to be inking a lot of panels and a lot of pages so go easy on yourself you're more likely to get burnt out on the process if you're doing everything pristinely perfect all the time it's just not realistic so learn shortcuts find them and use them because they're going to help you finish your project and that's the goal here is to finish your project okay step six scanning if you don't have a scanner, you could probably get away with taking photographs of your pages and then uploading and editing them that way. Although I would be a little bit wary of any warping or angles or just the inconsistent lighting that you might get with photographing these yourself. Scanning is definitely easier, but I understand that a lot of people don't have access to a scanner. If you do have a scanner, make sure that you have access to the advanced settings and that you're able to scan it at at least 300 dpi. That's kind of the standard quality. I scanned mine as JPEG files and then uploaded them into Photoshop to do some basic editing. If you don't have something like Photoshop, there are plenty of free image editing softwares out there that you can use. Most computers these days have some sort of basic photo editing software kind of bundled into whatever default viewer program they have, um, so you could always use that. However, I did mine in Photoshop because I have Photoshop and I recommend it if you plan to do this kind of stuff a lot because it's going to make your life a lot easier. But basically, I just created an adjustment layer that I could then copy and paste above each image. Basically, I had one Photoshop file that had all the pages on separate layers. So one Photoshop file... 31 layers, one for each page, and then I would just paste the adjustment layer above each page so that they all had more or less the same adjustments and looked consistent when they were printed. Another thing if you do plan to print your project, you probably want to make sure your mode is in CMYK and not RGB. CMYK is the standard for printing and ultimately it's just one less thing that the computer has to communicate with the printer because when those two get to talking, it's just miscommunication central. And if any of these things don't make sense to you, you can always do research. You can always just Google what they mean and what they are. If you don't know what CMYK is or you don't know what DPI is, you know, you can always find out that information. Believe me, I had to teach a lot of this to myself too, so <laughs> I know where you're at, but it's okay. You can learn. Now, I also want to mention something that I started doing in my project that I ended up changing. I started putting my text over my pages in Photoshop. I did it on a separate layer, and then I would just group that text with that page, and so I would kind of have access to everything if I needed to go in and tweak something. It was no big deal. But I don't really recommend doing your text in Photoshop. I would recommend doing your text in whatever book formatting software you plan to use, which I used InDesign, and again, I'll get to that in a minute. 
The reason I don't recommend using Photoshop for your text is you want to leave some room for flexibility. If your panel needs to be cropped more than you anticipated, then odds are your text might get cropped off and you have to go back and change the file in Photoshop and then re-import it and it's just kind of a mess. So I don't recommend doing that, um, but you can if that makes you feel more comfortable. Um, I just found that it really wasn't the best fit for my project, so I ended up doing my text in InDesign instead. The next thing that I would recommend doing is taking your Photoshop file and duplicating it. That way you kind of have a master copy and then a copy copy. Then what you want to do is merge the adjustment layer onto each page so that it's like a flat image and if you do your text in Photoshop you want to have your adjustment layer and then your text and then the image itself and you want to merge those so you do that with all of your pages and then make sure all of the layers are visible then you can just go file export layers to files and basically you can just mass export all of your files instead of having to do it one by one huge time saver for me definitely going to be doing that from now on um so little life hack for you if you didn't know you can always export your layers to files i exported mine as jpg and saved them as the highest quality possible and also for the next step you want to do yourself a favor and just create a separate folder where you can put all of those files. The reason you're going to do that is because if you plan to use InDesign to format your book like I did, InDesign works by finding the link to those files on your desktop so you're not actually putting that full res image into InDesign. It's just linking it to wherever it is on your desktop. So if you move the file, then that link is broken and InDesign is not going to know where that image is. So. Definitely just put all your pages into one file, label them, you know, page one through whatever, and then, you know, label the files so that it's easy to find. Organization is definitely key. Okay, <laughs> now moving on to the next step, which is step eight. I think I might have said that the last step was step six, but it was actually step seven. Now this is step eight. Formatting. <laughs> You guys, I could go on a whole rant about InDesign and how it was a totally steep learning curve for me, but at the end of the day, I'm really glad I used it. Speaking from my experience, I am way more comfortable using Adobe Photoshop than I am using Adobe InDesign. I could have totally done this project all in Photoshop. However, InDesign, once you know it, is easier <laughs> and it allowed me to do a lot of cool things that Photoshop doesn't allow me to do or requires more work to do in Photoshop than it does in InDesign, if that makes sense. Now, I am lucky because my dad is actually, he's a graphic designer, he has his own graphic design company and he's been a graphic designer my entire life. So I had my dad basically on standby ready to be called at a moment's notice. I could just call him up and say, hey dad, why aren't my pages printing properly? And so he gave me a lot of advice and help, some of which I will be able to pass on to you guys. Um, but what I would say, even before you really delve into whatever book formatting software you are planning to use, I would recommend making a little kind of like test booklet. This was just done with regular printer paper. I kind of like cut it into, I think it was like thirds across. So I just have a little mini version. This isn't like to scale, um, but I didn't staple it and you don't want to staple it. You just want to fold it in half and then you want to go through and you want to label and number all of your pages. So you can see I labeled this front cover and then inside front cover, um, the forward, and then this would be page one, page two, page three, page four, and so on and so forth. So you have an idea of which pages are going to be on your middle spread and everything like that. You also know how many pages your, your book will be total. Even though my story is 31 pages, the book itself is 36 pages and I'll get into that. But you can see what you end up with is one sheet of our 
hypothetical eight and a half by 14 inch paper and on one side you have the front cover and back cover and then on the other side you have the inside front cover and then the inside back cover so one sheet of paper is four pages which means your book needs to have pages that are a multiple of four because whether you like it or not there's going to be four pages, even if one of those pages is blank. So this comes in super, super handy because once you have this little kind of template, then you know exactly which pages are going to be side by side. They are not necessarily going to be sequential, <laughs> um, especially if you're printing this manually, like I did. I do not have like a fancy duplex printer. It does not print double-sided. So I had to kind of hack the double-sided printing myself. Um, and my dad helped a lot with this, with numbering the pages. But once I have my handy dandy little template guide, then I know page 11 and page 20 are actually going to be next to each other, which my brain and my ability to do math automatically in my head would not have been able to tell me that. So make one of these, it's going to save your life. And then when you are formatting your book in InDesign, you wanna make sure that you're kind of just following this, that your first spread is your front cover and back cover. And then your next spread is your inside front cover and your inside back cover and then so on and so forth so you're just going to go buy the book on this one <laughs> and listen to your little template guide now I will kind of briefly give you the overview of my document setup just in case you are interested or curious uh, in InDesign my document setup looked like this the intent was to print the file the total number of pages was 18. Now, this can be kind of tricky because in actuality, I used nine sheets and the total number of pages in my book is 36 pages. So you have nine pages, 18 pages, 36 pages. How do they all relate to each other? So to explain this a little bit easier, because I feel like the word pages can be confusing, I have nine sheets of paper in my template. So you can see I actually have like nine physical sheets here, but I have 18 pages because each sheet is two pages because you have the front and the back. Now, each of these pages is broken down into two other pages, two pages per side. So I have two pages on the front, two pages on the back, total of four pages per sheet. So the 18 pages is referring to the front and back of your sheets. So nine sheets times two is 18. But because I have two pages per side, then it's really nine times four, which is 36. So it's 18 pages in the document setup, but depending on where you are in this process, pages means different things. For paper size, I made sure that I selected legal, which is eight and a half by 14 inch paper and when in, when folded in half is eight and a half by seven which is the size of the book like i mentioned for the margin i put 0.25 just in case you're curious and i had no bleed and no slug so those are all kind of like book formatting terms that we don't really even need to get into because um, they're not really important because if you don't have a duplex printer, you're not going to be printing this as a booklet. If you go to InDesign and you go to file, you have the option to print and the option to print booklet. If you're printing with your printer at home, odds are good it's not a double sided printer, meaning it can only print on one side at a time. This means it's not going to work it, with the print booklet feature, which is why we have to mess around with changing the page format to be kind of funny and also why we have to print it manually or just under the file print option. We'll get into printing in a minute, but I kind of just want to briefly go over the tools in InDesign that I used and how I use them. The main tool that I used was the rectangular frame tool. Basically with this tool, I could just drag and drop on my spread where I wanted a panel to be. And then I could adjust the size of that rectangular frame if I wanted to with the open arrow. And then I could just drag and drop the image directly into that rectangular frame. 
Then using the closed arrow and making sure that the image was selected, I could adjust the size and where that panel was on the page and, and everything like that. So really to make your panels, you are going to be using three tools. You're going to be using your rectangular frame tool, your open arrow and your closed arrow and you can just drag and drop your file into that page. And when I had a page with multiple panels on it, I would just drag and drop that same file onto those different panels, and that's how it worked. It's actually really easy and self-explanatory once you do it and you kind of get the hang of it. Um, it's really intuitive and it makes a lot of sense. Now, to make the speech bubbles, this was something that I um, kind of had to figure out, and it ended up being really, really easy, but I would not have known how to do it had I not kind of looked it up. So I'm gonna kind of briefly overview that process for you. So in InDesign, I just created a new document. It can kind of be like whatever size you want. Uh, you're going to go to your ellipse tool, create a little circle or oval or whatever kind of general shape you want the speech bubble to be. Keep in mind, you can always kind of like tweak it and adjust the size and shape a little bit once you're done so it doesn't have to be like the end all be all speech bubble you can move it around later then you're going to go to your pen tool and you're going to create a little triangle that's going to be the little like talking director for your speech bubble uh, you guys know what they look like right it's not this shape but it's like this shape right so you create a little triangle great then you're going to go to your open arrow select both the ellipse or the circle and the triangle and then you're going to go to your pathfinder and hit add this is going to join those two shapes together and then making sure they're both selected again you can change the color of the fill and the outline personally for me i made both the fill and the outline white because i didn't want the the speech bubble to have a harsh outline um in most cases there were a couple of panels where i did add an outline just to make sure they didn't like blend in too much but that's how I made speech bubbles and I just made a couple of different ones so I had a few options to pull from and then basically just selected them from the one document copied pasted them into the book and then moved them around and adjusted them like I needed to then I just took the text tool and created a text box directly on top of it and there you go speech bubble now step nine printing <laughs> printing is another thing that is like really complex to try and explain but i'm gonna do my best so first thing which i kind of alluded to back in the planning phase you have to ask yourself whether you're going to print this yourself or outsource it you can always send the file to a local printer and maybe they'll even format it for you in some cases um, or if you've already formatted it yourself, then you can send it off to them and they can print it to you and maybe they send you a proof so you kind of look it over um, and then they print the book for you and there you have it. However, there are pros and cons to both printing it yourself and printing it uh, using a company. So I kind of want to break those down. Number one, if you print it with a company, it's more expensive. There's no really getting around that. It's going to be pricier. Um, the minimum amount that you need to order might be higher, so it's more of an upfront investment. Before you've even sold any books, you might be investing in getting 50 or 100 copies of it. So that can be pretty steep if you're just starting out and you're not even sure if you're going to sell these. So something to definitely consider. The other thing is that outsourcing your printing means a slower deadline you're kind of working off of their time frame and it's not really like they can get it to you overnight unless you're willing to pay extra for a rush job so it's a slower process there might be some more back and forth it might take you a week or so to get the proof and then once you send the proof back with edits um, then you get you know the updated version and then maybe after a few rounds of that you get your final product but it could be a few weeks so if you do plan to outsource your printing you need to include that in your overall time frame and deadline for the project the other downside is if there is a mistake with the file you might not know it until you get that first proof 
or maybe you missed a mistake and now you have 50 copies with mistakes on them. So it's a little bit easier to catch minor mistakes when you're printing it at home because you can kind of look through each version one at a time and if you do make a, like one mistake and you've only printed one book, it's not that big of a deal. However, I will say outsourcing your printing guarantees that it will be of high quality and it will be very professionally done. Um, they will probably also bind it for you, I'm assuming. I guess that's not always the case. If they're just printing the pages, they could just send you the pages to bind. Um, so that's something that you also have to look into. Maybe they charge you extra for binding them. Um, depending on the kind of binding that you're doing, they might not be able to do it. So that's a whole other thing and we'll get to binding as our last step. But um, I think if you do want to outsource your printing, that's great. I chose not to <laughs> because I have a printer that was very expensive and even though it's a pain in the butt, I um, begrudgingly chose to print it myself. So when you print it yourself, obviously it's cheaper. Um, the printer itself and, and keeping up with the ink and maintenance on the printer is expensive and maybe that's an initial investment, but once you have the printer, printing projects like this on it is really, really low cost. Along with that, if you have a printer like I do that tends to be very, very temperamental, um, there is always the likelihood that the quality is going to be a little bit less than what you would get from a professional printing company. That's true with me and I mean, I'm not shy about that fact. Like <laughs> this is at home printing. Um, I am not a professional printing service. So, you know, there's a little bit of dip in that quality, but the fact that I get to save so much money on printing this project is really what made this project possible in the first place. However, a huge plus of printing it at home is that you get to print a lower quantity. So even though it might be a little bit less expensive and lower quality wise, occasionally with an asterisk, depending how good you are at figuring out your printing settings, um, you don't have to print a hundred copies of your book. You can just print two or three and give them to your friends and family. However, if you are planning to print a hundred of them, you might want to just go ahead and outsource because my printer uh, takes about three minutes to print one side of the page. So if you do the math, which I had my boyfriend do the math yesterday, it takes about 54 minutes to print one of these, <laughs> which is just not practical if you're printing like a huge quantity. So that's definitely something you want to keep in mind. Some other things to consider in the printing phase is whether or not you're going to print in color or black and white. I mean, it kind of goes without saying that if you color the comic with color, you would probably want to print it in color, even though black and white is cheaper. Why would you spend all the time adding color if you were just going to print it black and white? Um, but if you did the entire comic in black and white, then by all means print it in black and white because it's cheaper both at home and if you outsource your printing. The next thing is the paper that you're using too. You definitely want to think about the papers that you will be printing on. I printed on a legal sized cardstock that's not overly thick, but definitely gives the book like a thicker, sturdier feel. Um, you know, it's not computer paper. It doesn't have like any uh, sheen on it or anything. It's, it's more matte. Um, and it really does give a nice sturdy feel to the book because it's got that like weight to it. So it feels really nice in your hands. Um, it will hold up to a little bit of like wear and tear because it's not just like computer paper that's going to dissolve, you know, five minutes from getting it. So I chose to print it on legal cardstock. I will have the one that I got down below. I just got it on Amazon. So you can check it out there. Now print settings. Print settings are a whole beast. Um, kind of like learning InDesign, it's just a learning curve that you kind of have to navigate and it's going to largely depend on so many different things like your printer and um, you know what program you're using and all those sorts of things. So the advice that I give in this section should really be taken with a grain of salt. So just kind of keep that in mind. So when you open up the document in InDesign and you go file, print, not print booklet, uh, you will see a couple of different options. So the first thing that you want to do is make sure if you go to page setup, it will open your uh, kind of printer 
window, you want to make sure that the paper size in your printer window lines up with the window in InDesign. So make sure that in my case, I had to make sure that both said legal size eight and a half by 14 inch paper. Um, in the printer window, while you have it open, you probably want to choose the type of paper that you're using. Um, I selected like plain white, bright paper, and then I selected like finest quality or highest quality. Um, so those are pretty much all the things that you do like in your printer's individual window. Then back in InDesign, you wanna make sure that you've selected print spreads. That way it prints both pages side by side. So when you fold them, you have a book. Other than that, I don't think there are any additional printer settings that I used. If you're like me and you have a printer that only prints on one side, um, there are two ways that you can do this. One is harder than the other. So the first way that I um, printed the book was I only put one sheet of paper in the feed tray at a time and I would wait those three minutes for it to print on one side and then I had to quickly um, flip the paper over and put it back through the printer again so it would print on the back. So you also really want to know which direction your printer prints in and which is going to be the top, which is going to be the bottom. That's important. Um, so that's one way you can do it. That was difficult. Um, the way I would recommend doing it is going into your InDesign document and selecting all the odd number pages. So page one, three, five, so on and so forth, all through your document. Um, and basically if you just like double click and then, you know, go print, uh, you can select the option for print current page or yeah, print current page. And you can just double check that the number corresponds with the page that you wanna print. So it should say like H1, and then you, you know you should have H1 selected. So um, that's like your page one spread. Um, and then so it'll print that, and then you can just kind of queue up your printer to go one, three, five, so on and so forth. So I did that, so it would print those nine odd pages. And then I would, once that was done, I would kind of flip those pages through again I would not you know make sure you don't change the order or anything um, make sure they're lined up properly and then I would just put them back into the printer and then print all the even pages if that makes sense I know it's super complicated guys like when I'm just describing it but like it's it's doable it's absolutely doable and then once it's all printed to bind it I just used a long arm stapler mine looks like this I will have it linked down below because I got it on Amazon. And against recommendation, I used heavy duty staples because I'm using thick paper. So even though this stapler says it does not recommend using heavy duty staples, I used heavy duty staples and it worked fine. So <laughs> um, I also picked up my heavy duty staples on Amazon, but you can find them literally anywhere. So I don't I don't think you guys need the link to that. It's no big deal. Um, but that's how I binded the book, bound the book. I'm not sure. Um, but you can see there's just two staples on the spine of the book, one here and one here. So they kind of just fit seamlessly onto the spine of the book. And that's how I bind them. And you just want to make sure that it does, in fact, go through the center of your book. Um, and that's really all there is to it, guys. So that's how I took my comic from an idea to a physical book that I now have in my hand and a book that you can pre-order. So definitely do that. Um, and if you want to make your own comic, I think that's awesome. It's a lot of work, <laughs> but I'm really happy that I did it. I learned a lot in this process. Um, and shout out to you guys for being so supportive of this project. I love seeing you guys like comment every day when the new page goes up and you're like so excited to read it. It makes me really happy. So um, I don't think this will be my last comic, but it will probably be a while before I commit to doing another one because this was a lot of work and I am just, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm so tired. Um, but thank you guys for the support and definitely pre-order it before October 31st. The link is down below. Thank you again to my patrons. You guys are amazing. And they've been getting early access to the pages all month long. 
So if you haven't been pledging to Patreon, you've been missing out because they've been getting all the sneak peeks and they've been getting first access to everything. So yeah. Okay. Thank you guys for watching. I'm sorry this was so long, but it's a process. Um, and I wanted to give you guys all the information that I had and everything that I learned so that if you guys do this, um, you learn from my mistakes and hopefully make something even better. So, okay. I love you guys and I will see you on the internet. Bye.